Thank you. Yeah, so um, next we have uh, Itai and I, our last speaker for, for the day. Um, Itai and I is a professor at the NYU School of Medicine. His research focuses on the interface of gene expression development and evolution and revolves around studying dynamic biological needs through the lens of gene regulation. Itai received his PhD in bioinformatics from Boston University and completed postdoctoral fellowships in molecular genetics at the Weizmann Institute and in development genetics um, at Harvard University. He served as an assistant and associate professor at the Technion uh, Institute of Technology in the Department of Biology, and was a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard and a visiting professor at the Broad Institute. In addition to his own research, Itai, together with his colleague, colleague um, Martin Lurcher from HHU, recently co authored a science book titled The Society of Genes, and together they're studying the ideas behind night science, the scientific creative process. Together they publish editorials exploring these concepts and have a popular podcast where they interview scientists about their own creative process. Um, this is such an important, fascinating, uh, fascinating topic, and it's, I, we're so happy to have you here. So uh, thanks a lot, and you have to say. Thank you, thank you, Mo. I hope uh, everybody can hear me okay. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm, I'm very fortunate that the Argentina uh, Netherlands game is in a halftime, so I have a few minutes of your attention, I think. And what I want to tell you about is the creative scientific process, as as Mo said. Uh, I would like for this to be as interactive as possible within uh the context so i promise to to try to read any oops whoa i hate when that happens did you get it all good uh i promise to read the chat and we can turn this into a discussion uh at any point so i kind of want to skip to the very end right away what i want to tell you about is that there is of course, an underlying process that leads us to do science in, in such a way that uh, produces results. And there's already something in the chat. <laughs> then the game, oh, then the, then the, yes, I also hope it's more entertaining than the game, but uh, I have a big competition. So what is the, uh, what is the process? What I wanna tell you is that there are tools that you can use and, uh, a very, very useful tool, the number one tool that I'll tell you about today, is that it's helpful to distinguish what we do in science into two parts, a, a so-called day science part and a so-called night science part. In this way, we can categorize the executive part where we have the idea, we have the hypothesis, we know what we want to do, we have a set goal, and now it's a matter of executing it. That's, we, that's what we call day science. Night science is when we're trying to figure out what the goal is in the first place. What's, what's the idea? And what I'll tell you about are uh, six tools that can help us get to that. I don't know if we'll be able to get to all the tools within the hour, but, but we'll try. And certainly um, you can read more offline, but think about it this way. Day science is to take a hypothesis and to try to falsify it, right? That's how we're supposed to do science. But it says nothing about how we get the idea in the first place. Where do we get ideas? One way, one great night science way is to improvise ideas. Improvising ideas is something we do with ourselves, but more commonly with other people. It's sort of like the, the, uh, the principles by which we have a discussion with another person and exchange ideas. And, and that's a great way to generate ideas. Uh, the goal of day science, of course, is to test the hypothesis. But as we just said, we need a way to generate the hypotheses. And that's uh, that falls under the purview of night science. In day science, we act in a very disciplinary way. And I don't mean that we're disciplined and that we show up to work, although of course that's a part of it. But I mean, the very construct of how academia is set up is to divide knowledge into disciplines, right? We have the school of life sciences. We, within that, we have departments, maybe neuroscience, maybe molecular biology. Then, then, then there's chemistry. What kinds of chemistry 
that's in a totally different aspect than biology, though, and, and physics. So uh, everything is separated. Computer science is is in, integrated in what way? Is it? It's really you have to sort of be interdisciplinary to be educated. As many people, I, I believe, in this Zoom are both the life sciences and the uh, and CS. But really, where are you going to get ideas? Usually, it's importing ideas from other fields. So for night science, we have to be interdisciplinary. The language of day science is very different from the language of night science. And sometimes we mistake the language of, of day science for being the entire language of, of science altogether. But really, to generate ideas, it really helps to have a metaphorical language, one where we could use uh, anthropomorphisms, analogies. And so while we can't use it in formal uh, conference presentations, say like here, when we have our more private exchanges, being metaphorical is extremely helpful for generating new ideas. Logic, the logic of day science is very different from the logic of night science. In day science, we expect consistent answers. In night science, we revel actually in contradictions. A contradiction can lead us to a new question, which is the ultimate goal really of night science, to generate a new question. And then something that I want to spend much of the hour talking to you about is the puzzle state. So this will seem very opaque at this point, but the notion is that in day science, you're very focused on a particular puzzle and you want to solve that puzzle. Night science questions whether you're really in the puzzle that you think you are to begin with and, and leads you to try to, to switch puzzles and reframe uh, the question as a different puzzle type. That should sound very opaque at this point, but I hope when I show you the same slide again in a few minutes uh, at the end of my talk, you will uh, say, oh, that's a good summary and now I understand it. Okay, you guys are being very quiet. I hope there are more questions that you could put in the chat as we go. I want to say that all of this, as Mo mentioned, is done together with my really good friend, Martin. Uh, Martin Lurcher is in the University of Dusseldorf, as Mo said. And we've collaborated for a long time. We really liked to, to collaborate. And so everything I've told you about is, is with him. Uh, we publish it as editorial. So everything I'll tell you about is also published as editorials. If, you, um, if something I say is not clear, you can just go to the source. And ultimately, I want to tell you what our goal is. And then you will understand the context of the podcast as well. Uh, our complaint is that we scientists get while we get really good training in day science aspects, we learn how to design an experiment, we learn how to execute uh, particular uh, subroutines, but, 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 uh, specific code, we, we learn ethics. Uh, I would call that all day science. And we are never trained in the creative part of science, right? We never take a course on how it is that we are supposed to generate ideas in the first place. And generating, generating ideas is at least half of the scientific method, the scientific process. So our goal, Martin and I's goal, is to generate a curriculum that, that professors throughout the world can, can cheat, teach in graduate schools, graduate programs. And to decide on what the curriculum for this course should be, we're trying to talk to as many people as we can get a hold of. And that's what the podcast is for. Is it's really our research. We have discussions and we sort of edit parts of those discussions discussions and put them online for uh, everyone to enjoy. And so you can check that out if you want to see what other people say about what should the creative process uh, be taught as. Okay, that was a kind of summary. Let's just go to the very beginning, okay? How does science work? If you are woken up in the middle of the night, someone shakes you out of your comfort and says, quick, tell me, how does science work? You will be able to put together a coherent statement. It's probably the statement that you were taught starting already in fourth grade, which is there's a problem, like the light bulb uh, doesn't emit light. I, I need some light coming out and it's, it's not coming out. I have a problem. I have a hypothesis. What's the hypothesis? That the, the bulb burnt out. Uh, my hypothesis is that if I just substitute a fresh bulb in there, then the light will start to come out again. I test my hypothesis. If it doesn't work, okay, that, that wasn't the problem. Maybe there's an electrical problem uh, that, that's different. And I, I test that new hypothesis until 
it works, and then I have my answer, right? That's how science works. The problem with that is that anyone that's ever done a project knows it never goes like that. That's not really um, a good summary. Even if it does go in such a straightforward manner, the generation of the hypothesis was really an interesting process in itself. Like, where did you get the idea? In many cases, it's not as simple as recognizing that there is a burnt bulb, right? Uh, so this, this is sheer fantasy. I, I know we teach it universally, but it's fantasy. I hope you'll agree. It's just, it's simply not true. And a closer description of the method, I think, was proposed by Francois Jacob. Uh, he, in his autobiography and in other places, distinguished between day science and night science. So Jacob uh, coined these terms. And uh, basically, he said, science has two parts, the executive part, the day science, hypothesis testing, and the dreamlike world of coming up with the idea in the first place called night science. And he wrote about it beautifully, by the way. He said, night science wanders blind. It hesitates, stumbles, recoils, sweats, wakes with a start, doubting everything. It is forever trying to find itself, question itself, pull itself back together. Night science is a kind of workshop of the possible where what will become the building material of science is worked out. So really, night science is the creative process. Uh, if, if you can think about it this way, there are an infinite number of experiments and software that you, you can write. That terrain is very rugged, right? There's so many, so many, imagine this, this terrain here, this mountain like terrain as a kind of map of all the possible experiments that you can do. Now, it's, it's impossible for you to do all of these, right? That's not, it's not a good search algorithm to just try to map every single possible script that you can write. So you need a shortcut. Night science is the shortcut. What you do is you pop out of this very, very, uh, of this reality and you try to make connections. You try to jump to other locations. When you have a new idea, you can then pop back in and write the specific code or do the specific experiment in the lab that's required. So in our conception of day science and night science, you of course need both of them. They, they work together. You, night science allows you to generate new idea. Then you pop back in and you do it. Now you're in day science mode, you execute it. When you look at the results, it may make you think. Um, it may make you want to think in a really abstract way. You therefore need to pop back out into night science mode. Uh, the full training of a scientist should be to be well-versed in both of these skills, don't you think? And really that aspect that creative part, and sometimes we, in science, when we communicate it to the outside world, we downplay the role of creativity in science, perhaps because we want to project more a robust uh, image, uh, but it does give off the image that science is not so cr creative to some people. They misunderstand this. Really, science is extremely creative. I hope you'll agree with me. In a sense, it's no different from the creativity that's involved in music and in art, right? If you think about music, you can think about it having a night part and a day part, right? When Taylor Swift is recording an album or giving a concert, you can say she's not really in a creative mode, She's more in the executive mode, right? The song has been written. Now it's just a matter of executing it, of do, of, of belting it out and, and uh, performing it to the world. Actually writing the song is very different. In that, she needs to be in night music mode. She's creative, pensive. She's, she doesn't have to, uh, to, the things don't have to look good right away. She's creating. Same thing with art. When the artist, is working on the canvas, presumably by that point, they've already had the idea. Uh, you don't, you, you, um, you sometimes go to a, a museum with someone and they will say, oh, you know, my nine-year-old kid can do something like that. Perhaps they could, perhaps their nine-year-old kid could do something like that, but that would only account for the day art part. Consider that there's also the night art part and perhaps their nine-year-old kid wouldn't have been able to conceive of doing that. 
in the first place. So the creative process in science is really shared with any creative process. Okay, now I want to tell you a story about Einstein. Uh, I want to, <laughs> it's, you know, it's really hard to do this without seeing any of your reactions. I hope you in uh, the internet world really do hear me, but it's hard to not have feedback, I must say. How do you all do this? Uh, oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. I can You're turn my camera on. Oh, yeah. that's so great. Yes, I should have thought of that before. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for taking the initiative. Um, that's great. So let's, uh, let's um, consider what might have happened with Einstein. Do you think that uh, the professor had a knock on his door and say, what can I do for you, Mr. Einstein? And Einstein said to him at a very young age of probably 23, Professor, what are, the, what are the greatest open questions of theoretical physics? I wish to tackle them. Oh, Zoe Piran says she's there. I'm so glad you're there, Zoe. Uh, <laughs> keep, saying, keep saying stuff like that. And then Professor, do you think the professor said, well, young man, as you would surely know, had you regularly attended my lectures, there are three major unsolved problems today. I don't think your talents are up to the task, but I will humor you. Number one, do you think the professor actually said this? Number one, how do we have to change the concept of time so that Maxwell's equations are no longer in contradiction with the observed constancy of the speed of light? Number two, the second open problem, how can the absorption and emission of light in discrete packages avoid inconsistencies in our concept of black body radiation? And finally, how can gravity be understood as deformations in space and time? Is that what was given to Einstein? We tend to think of science as kind of following the high road, which is that the elder generation decides on what are the greatest open problems, and then the younger generation come fresh, full of life, and tackle those problems. Uh, however, I want to show you that science is actually not predictable. We don't know which problems are going to be solved. We actually don't know what the problem is. Uh, let, let, let's say science was predictable. Then we would be able to ask back, let's say 1997, what were the open problems that were poised? People said, okay, these are what's going to be discovered next in the next 25 years and then we could look 25 years later what were the best the the biggest breakthroughs when we do this and this is just one way of, of looking at it but in general when we do this there's no overlap in other words we can't say what is the biggest problem now and expect that that's going to be the breakthrough what happens instead is that the breakthrough comes from nowhere the breakthrough was not predictable uh so in other words Sy uh, uh, einstein did not get those open questions. Einstein discovered those questions. Einstein's genius was to formulate those questions. What, what we just read before, those three questions, those were not given to him. It was the, the, the discovery of the question that was his contribution uh, in the product of his night science. So in general, you know, we have this image that knowledge is sort of like a brick wall. We have a wall of knowledge, and sometimes there's a gap in the knowledge. We call these uh, knowledge gaps, and we imagine that our goal is to, to fill them in and create a more finished edifice of knowledge, but that's not the truth. The, the, if you look in retrospect, where does the discovery come from? It was not predictable. We didn't know that there was a gap that that discovery filled in. A better way to characterize what our discovery is is that it's an unknown unknown. We didn't know that we didn't know it. That's the real breakthrough. I'll give you an example. This is a nice statement that uh, I uh, found in a talk by Leonard Susskind. And he was talking about Stephen Hawking. He said, this was Stephen Hawking's central point in 1976 when he created something that came to be known as the information paradox. It was an extremely deep and important observation. It wasn't important that Hawking didn't get the right answer he asked the right question. And this became a central debate that took 25 years to resolve. The point is that questions are not handed to you. What you oftentimes need to do in science to make a breakthrough is to create the very question uh, itself. And you know, many times you might, you might say, well, well, there was a question, for example, with Marie Curie, there was a question of where does radioactivity come from? The problem with that question is that it's, it's not, it doesn't really lead anywhere. 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't give you an opening for the breakthrough. The the genius of Marie Curie was to refocus the question, to to restate it, to to bring in some insight. So her refoc refocus question was: How does the radioactive activity depend on the form and quantity of the uranium in a given sample? And now that question, that's now actionable. Now she has a way to tackle it. So uh, I think many people have a kind of misunderstanding of the way science works, that we scientists are supposed to find answers. Really, most of the time, we're just trying to create new questions. Uh, all the good questions are gone right now. You can't, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a good question, you might hear someone talk about one, but they already have like a 10 year head start on it. You're gonna need to find your own question. And that's a difficult problem. So what have I said so far? Uh, we may think that scientific advances are predictable by having our top 10 lists. We, we talk about knowledge gaps and pretend that we're supposed to fill them. Uh, we talk about how scientists answer questions and we think about science in proceeding in a straightforward manner, right? Problem, hypothesis, testing, answer. Really, all of those are wrong. They're all wrong. Science is not predictable. The discovery is an unknown unknown. It doesn't fill a knowledge gap. We're not supposed to find a new, uh, uh, to answer a specific question. We're supposed to create a new question. And the process of science is anything but straightforward. Really, there's a night science component to it. When by, by just defining the problem is itself a whole uh, aspect. And sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's hidden. So, so it's good that we call it night science. But I would say that if you have a topic and you're making lots of observations, your goal should be to look for pattern. Just look for pattern after pattern. Many of those patterns will be spurious and, and not go anywhere. So you kind of have to be in this loop for quite a while. But then if you really uh, can sustain the, the uncomfortableness of being in this loop, you will eventually find a new pattern that leads to a new question. And now you've earned that new question. This is your question. Uh, and you can now apply the day science method. Uh, but as you can see, the, the part we are taught is, is just half of the story. Okay, so it's 3.23. Good, we're doing this great. Um, I want to now show you a, a movie, okay? Without context, what you're gonna see is some players, some, some students, some wear white shirts and some wear black shirts, and they're passing uh, two basketballs. I want you to focus on just the team of players in the white shirt and count how many passes they make. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. That was one. Okay. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? Did you see the gorilla? So as you were counting, this has been done many times and 50% of the people do not observe that a gorilla passed right through, pounded its chest and then walked out to the other side. This has been done on millions of participants. This from search by Dan. This, oh, this has been done on millions of participants and half of them don't see the gorilla. So, I have some questions, Itai. Yeah, good. What if it was a white gorilla? <laughs> count the, white, the, the passes between the white. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Or, or I guess, had you been asked to ask the passes white between white. the two? Yeah, right. Almost, almost identical, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Oh, and I like that you're asking a question. Please, many more. You two more. And everybody else on the panel and who can ask. Um, I, this experiment is one of the top 10 most famous experiments in psychology. It's been done in every particular way. 
And so, the, so they know, yeah, if, if, it's, if you change the color, it but is. But the text box is also all black with white color, which also right, is right. all standard. <laughs> yeah, everything was sort of set up for you to, to miss it. Uh, well, but we wondered, what is the data science equivalent of it? Can we have a gorilla hidden in a data set? So what we did is we created uh, a fake data set. Of course, the people didn't know it was fake, but for uh, many, many people, we had two numbers, how many steps they take every day and what is their body mass index, okay? So now you have, for a thousand people, you know how many steps each person takes and what's their BMI index. And then we divided the class. These are, these are students taking uh, introduction to computer science. We divide the class into two. One half is asked, Please take this data set and analyze it. What do you find? Tell us what you find. The other half are given a data set and, they, and, they're set and they're told, please explore this data set. Tell us what you find. We want to know what you find, but also tell us what's the p-value of the correlation between the number of steps and the body mass index. Okay, what is, what's the precise, is, is there a significant relationship? So we call the first group hypothesis free and the second group hypothesis focused. The only difference was to ask the other group to compute a p-value. Now, if you plot x versus y, number of steps versus body mass index, it's a gorilla. You just see it right away. There's no mistaking it. But what we found is that the people that did not have the hypothesis, they were just told to explore, they were three times more likely to see the gorilla than the people who also had to compute a p-value. And of course, it means nothing, you know, it's, it's, it, it means nothing to see a gorilla. It, for us, seeing the gorilla is just a proxy for it. Did the people plot the data? Because if you didn't plot the data, that means to us, you didn't even take the first step towards exploring the data set, right? You didn't even plot the data. And it seems as though the people that had the p-value to compute, they saw no reason to explore the data further, as though the hypothesis limited their their thinking and what could be possible in the data set. So uh, I think in the same way that we saw that we have selective attention with the psychology experiment, also in analyzing data sets, we, ha we have to admit that we could be liable to miss certain things because we're focused on particular hypotheses. The hypotheses could be a liability. What should you do instead? You should have a night science attitude, we like to say. You should be thinking about how can you explore this particular data set? What could be hiding there? Even just knowing that you're liable to, to miss a gorilla, just, just keeping in mind the gorilla experiment, I think already puts you in this frame of mind that there may be more things to do. Look at uh, the data from as many angles as possible. Try to be very playful with the data, compare everything to everything else. Imagine that you're this explorer and you're trying to make a map of the data, start in one direction, take every possible turn, try to stumble in different directions. Now, um, you can tell that, that analyzing a data set is not straightforward because when you take a data set, this is a paper published in, in Nature a couple of years ago. When you take the same data set and give it to different teams, each team will produce a different analysis, right? No two teams had an identical work, workflow for how to analyze a data set. In other words, when someone says to you, oh, you got this data set, did you analyze it? Are you done analyzing it? That's kind of a loaded question. There really is no one way to analyze a sufficiently complex data set, right? And that's because when you're analy analyzing a data set, you're bringing your whole set of knowledge to the data set. It's really a meeting between, oh, I'm so glad that you guys turned on your, your video, by the way, this is so much better. Uh, um, you know, you're, you're bringing everything that you know, it's a meeting of your mind with the data set. And it's a lot more complicated than testing a specific hypothesis. Actually, testing a specific hypothesis is rather simple relative to the different set of expectations that you might have given what you know about a data set. In other words, exploration requires a deep understanding. It's not a cheap way of doing analysis. It's actually a really deep way of doing analysis. However, I do recognize that some of you may have some hesitations the way I said 
that you, you should be playful in analyzing a data set. Sometimes, um, you know, we scientists to the outside world are not seen as playful. Maybe the public doesn't want to know about playful scientists. We're supposed to be giving them robust medicine, <laughs> and not not to just play around. So how do we how do we uh, address that? Well, the thing to remember is that this is the night science part that we're talking about. There's also day science, which is the adult in the room. So we've all heard about correlation is not causation. That's absolutely true. Think about it this way though. Night science produces correlations, right? Some of them may be spurious. It produces patterns. Some of them just but may be plain wrong or don't lead anywhere. Day science is, is then able to, whatever you found in a playful way, you can now, in a day science way, produce an independent data set to validate that claim. And that's how you get out of the logical problem of being accused of maybe fudging the analysis or p-hacking. Uh, think about the exploratory phase is idea generation. And then you use a validating independent data set to test the hypothesis that you generated from the first part. Okay. I was so, kind of thinking if I can interrupt you for a second. Of course. When saying, there, there is this paper from 2020, different teams, you know, deployed different analysis, found different things. Yeah. But when we read papers, we're all supposed to, the paper is supposed to be written in a very unambiguous way. We're all supposed to understand the same thing when we read the paper. Right. Is that a good thing? Uh, I mean, I think it's I think it's fine because what the authors report on is their their own set of analyses. Uh, I think a, a lot of us have this experience of of downloading other people's published data sets and then using it for new analyses that perhaps the authors uh, didn't do, didn't conceive of. So as long as you you um, distinguish, two things, you're fine. I think you need to distinguish uh, the realm of possible analyses, that's night science, but then the published version, what the authors chose, that's that's sort of one workflow. And, and we can ask how robust are the results from that particular workflow? And th those are good questions for that for that aspect, but we, we should always keep in mind that there are many different ways, maybe integrating with external data sets, many different ways to also analyze that data set. Yes, Good thanks. Question. I was actually just trying to be a little less serious and maybe imagining one of your papers, future papers with uh, Martin being meant to be understood in multiple different ways. Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be fun, <laughs> that would be fun. All right, now I wanna tell you about uh, a different aspect. I think many people in the room have a computer science background. So you're used to thinking about puzzles and, and many times we frame the problem, the projects that we're trying to solve in our work as puzzles, right? You can actually think about nature as being a kind of tapestry of puzzles. So, uh, and I have to tell you, I, I grew up with a dad who would always ask me puzzles whenever we would be driving on a long drive, he would you know, give me these puzzles <laughs> and I, I would uh, have to be quiet for a long time trying to solve them. And one thing I really grew to like about my dad's puzzles, I think it's a unifying aspect of all puzzles. I really like this is that before you solve the puzzle, it seems impossible. Like how, how is it, how can you do this? I'm, right? And then you figure it out. And after you figure it out, you can't imagine how is it possible for someone else not to know the answer. It just seems so obvious, right? That's the great asymmetry uh, of puzzles. They seem so obvious. Uh, in retrospect. And I think puzzles are a great way to think about what um, we scientists do. So I want to tell you about how Martin and I classified puzzles into four different classes. Okay, we, we think that all puzzles, both scientific and recreational, can be classified into four different classes. One class is a jigsaw puzzle. And this is the most simple one conceptually. You get all the pieces, so it's closed world because you have all the pieces, and the trick is to find the connections between them, right? So uh, there are many puzzles, there are many papers. When you read the paper, you could say, oh, this is, this is in a sense a jigsaw puzzle. For example, this is the paper that I worked on in my lab, 
we sequenced using single cell RNA seq cells of the placenta of, of the pancreas, and then we tried to describe all the cell types and cell states. So we had all the parts; those are the cells, the transcriptomes. And we just had to put them all together. Each one is it, what cell type is it? What cell state? So it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You just have to put it together. Just some of them could be really complicated. You can think about the sequencing of the human genome is a big jigsaw puzzle. You can think about figuring out the structure of a protein uh, as a jigsaw puzzle, right? You you know the amino acids need to be somewhere. The question is exactly where. Just like a jigsaw puzzle, you know each piece has to be there. The only question is where precisely. So that's one class of puzzle. Second class, and this I have to say is my dad's favorite, it's a logical puzzle. Here, it's also closed world. You get all the pieces, but it's you can't test all the possible answers. It's just too many combinations. You need to find the trick, so to speak. You need a trick that saves you from testing all possible answers. So. This will give you an uh, insight into my childhood. These are the kinds of questions my dad would ask me. Uh, here's an example of a logical riddle. Imagine you have 12 coins, 11 <clears throat> of which have the same height, same weight. Okay, The remaining coin is either heavier or lighter. My dad's not going to tell you which, uh, if it's heavier or lighter. It's just different. It's an odd coin. Uh, now, you can use the scale four times, Okay, four weighings. And the problem is that the, the scale, the balance, is a unique one. It, you put, of course, something on the left side, something on the right side, and it outputs X, Y, or Z, which is uh, equal weights. The two are equal. The right is heavier or the left is heavier. The problem is, you know, you just all of a sudden you put three coins here, three coins there, say, or four coins, four coins, and you get Y. The problem is you don't know what Y means. It, y could mean that they're equal. It could mean left is heavier, or right is heavier. So with four weighings, how do you figure out <laughs> what is the odd coin? I think you will agree with me. Wait, uh, Alex has the answer? I think so. Well, that was fast. It took a lot longer than it took me. <laughs> uh, are you sure? It's really, it's, it's, it seems like it was like three nanoseconds. Almost. Um, okay, almost. I work. Okay, okay. Um, that's impressive. Just, just I knew bringing, I was talking... my, bringing my wallet. Yeah, just to uh, test it out. I, I knew I was talking to an intelligent crowd, but this is the next level. Um, so it's closed world because you know the structure of the answer. There's no tricks in the sense of, uh, you know, you melt the coin, but uh, you do need a kind of logical trick, right? And I'll leave you to figure it out. Uh, there are also papers that you can say, you can look at the paper and you can say, ah, the authors conceived the problem as a logical puzzle. So for example, this paper by Francis Crick, 1957, he was trying to figure out what is the genetic code? How do you have a system where in a language of four nucleotides, ACGT, you can now code for 20 amino acids? How does that code work? And he... Um, he started off this sentence, uh, he started off his paper with this sentence. This paper deals with a mathematical problem, sounds like puzzle, which arose in connection with, a pro with protein synthesis. We present the solution here because it gives the magic number 20 so that our answer may perhaps be of biological significance. What did he do, him, him and his colleagues? Uh, he said, well, if we just add a certain constraint then we're left with 20 possibilities. How does it work? First, he said, the code is most likely three letters because it can't be one to one because you're going from four to 20. It can't even do two. It can't even be two to one because then you only have 16 combinations. So he reasoned that it would be three. And that way he was right. Uh, but then he added the constraint because there's 64 possibilities. So how do you go from 64 to 20? He added a constraint that it's comma free meaning that you, uh, it's always evident to know which frame of, uh, which open reading frame you're in. And so in order to meet that constraint, 
these four have to be ruled out because if it's a a a a a a a a a you won't ever know what the frame is so he takes out those four and then 60 are left and of those 60 you take each triplets like this and to make it comma free you can only choose one and so you choose one out of every every each one of these uh, 20 groups so you go to 20 that's how he got to the magic number 20 in other words he was thinking about this problem as a logical puzzle and there are many cases like this where you read the paper and you realize, okay, the authors frame their work as a logical puzzle. There's another class. This class of puzzles uh, we call uh, making a, an external connection. Here, it's not closed world like the other two I just told you about. You're missing information. You need to make a connection. The archetype is the word riddle. Let me tell you one word riddle. But before that, I want to ask more and Alex how much time do I have I could talk forever so you tell me so all together we have an hour hopefully with discussion oh so should I finish course. okay so I'll try to finish it and let's say nine I mean minutes. we can also it's so it's up to you we have an hour all together okay. I'll finish in nine minutes and then I hope we can have lots of questions um okay so imagine this story a man cooks nine meatballs for his sick father, and he wants his daughter to bring over the, the meatballs. He puts them in a pot, uh, but he labels it IX, in other words, nine, because he has nine meatballs using a permanent marker. On the way, the girl eats three meatballs, and so she's going to get caught, right? Because it says nine, but there's only six because she ate three. She has the marker, though, so she cannot erase any of these markings. She can't erase it, but she can add something to it. What should she do so that her grandfather not suspect that she ate the meatballs? Oh, I can write on this, right? So I'm going to write the answer because this is a... Don't worry, Alex, you solved the hard one. <laughs> so what she should write is this. And the reason why that, that is a, a great riddle, I think, is because you have to make a connection between Roman numerals and English, right? So that like you, you were thinking in Roman numeral world, and that doesn't work. It seems impossible to, to stay in Roman numeral world. And so you have to make a leap into an external connection. And there's a lot of, oh, how do I now exit this? <laughs> Sorry, sorry, mouse. <laughs> this is why I don't do this. Okay. Uh, now, there are many papers where you can say, ah, what the breakthrough was is a class three puzzle. They made a connection. Uh, Kurt Goidel did this, did this when he was um, trying to show that, that any formal system cannot be contradiction free. He made this connection to number theory, and that's how he showed it. Darwin made it when he made a connection to the work of uh, Maltus, who was a, an economist, so like totally different field from biology, to economics, but he noticed the connection, and the rest is history. I want to get to the fourth class. So the, the, the final class that Martin and I believe there is, is one where uh, uh, you have to think outside the box. So think about this puzzle. What is the car hiding? What number? You know, the participants can write in the chat too. Although for some reason I can't open the chat. Hmm. So it's okay. a webinar, but we've given everybody permissions to unmute themselves. Oh, good. Unmute yourself if you know the answer. 87? Ah, yes, yes, exactly right. It's 87. Why? Because uh, you uh, more noticed that there was kind of a bad assumption that the puzzle was leading us to make, uh, which is that it's this way. What if it's upside down? If it's upside down, now you see the pattern. And so this class is one where there are, are it's really a trick question, right? We, we've, we're told a problem but we've made an implicit 
bad assumption. And the trick is to figure out what that bad assumption is. Uh, th this is the, the quintessential puzzle where you're supposed to, you're, you're asked, let me see if I can write it. You're, you're asked to connect all four, sorry, all nine dots with a line. So here you see this, it's uninterrupted. Ugh. And um, it only has, this one has five straight edges, right? So the question is, can you do it in four? And to do it, I'll just give you the answer. Many of you know this, I think. To do this, you have to recognize that nowhere did we say that you have to stay inside the box. If you, can, if you allow yourself to go outside the box, then now you can uh, get them all. Almost had it like that. Um, so that's how you do it with four. And this is where actually the phrase to think outside the box comes from. Okay. Does this, does this happen in science? I would say yes. CRISPR is a great example of thinking outside the box. When CRISPR was first described, and for many years, uh, I mean, actually, this is why it was even na named. Why, why is CRISPR called CRISPR? It stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. In other words, the emphasis is on the repeats. What is in between the, okay, if this is one repeat, there's another repeat. What is in between them? We call them spacers, suggesting that their entire function is, is to serve the, the important repeats. Then the discovery was that actually the spacers are the main thing. The spacers are the sequences that correspond to the viral elements, leading this to be a bacterial immune system. So here you have to think outside the box. You have to realize, wait, I made a bad assumption. The spacers are not spacing. The spacers are actually what's important. So altogether, you can think about the four classes uh, as going along two dimensions. Either it's a closed world, you get all the parts like in a jigsaw puzzle or in a logical puzzle, or it's open world, you have to make a connection to something else or recognize that you have a bad uh, assumption. And the other dimension is whether it's finding connections, like in a jigsaw puzzle, you have to find the connections among the pieces, or you have to reframe, you have to, you have to find a trick, right? In the out of the box, you have to find the trick, uh, bad, bad assumption. And uh, in a logical puzzle, you also have to find the trick. So why am I telling you all this? It's that in, in undergrad, whenever we, we teach students or whenever we, we have these puzzles, many times the puzzle tells you, you, you know, you always know what kind of a puzzle you're in. Let's say you're taking physics and someone describes a problem for you, like this kind of a problem. It's well described, like you know exactly what kind of a puzzle you're in. Thing is, in science, you don't know what puzzle you're in. And that's one of the major challenges of science. The major challenges of creative thinking is to realize that the puzzle you think you're in may not be the real one that leads to a good idea. You may think that you're in a jigsaw puzzle, but really you're in an out of the box puzzle. It hasn't been defined properly for you and you have to realize that there's a bad assumption. You may think you're in a logical puzzle, but really it's an outside connection that needs to be made to solve this problem. So in a sense, it's kind of like an outer loop where you may think that you're trying to solve a puzzle. Like people will ask you, what, what are you doing? Hey, what's your job? I'm trying to solve this puzzle. Really, there's an outer loop, a kind of night science loop where you need to consider where that you may not be in the puzzle you think you're in. Uh, I can give you an example. In, in my work, we had this problem of trying to figure out why are some genes uh, in big gene duplication families? You know, some gene could be in three copies in a genome and other genes may only be single copies in a genome. So what, what determines the size of the gene family? And we conceive this as a type three puzzle because we made this connection to alternative splicing. We said, ah, if a gene doesn't use alternative splicing, it can make more isoforms by gene duplication. But if it does use alternative splicing, it could just be one gene. So we, we formulated it this way. It was only years later that we realized that we had made a bad assumption. Uh, we didn't realize there could be hidden attributes that correlate with both of those. 
Uh, and, and so we, we figured out our bad assumptions and then we, we solved it as a class four puzzle. So puzzle switching, I think is a great tool for creativity. Force yourself to say, which puzzle am I implicitly thinking I'm in right now? And then ask yourself, what would it look like as a different class? If you're conceiving this as a logical puzzle, what would it look like as an external connection puzzle? And you could ask, is there a pattern to it? Martin and I think that there is a kind of pattern where most times things start out as a jigsaw puzzle and then they, they morph out of it into a logical. So jigsaw puzzle tends to, seems to be a great place to start. If you don't know where to start, just think to yourself, I'm gonna make a map of everything. And that seems to be fruitful ground for then matriculating to another puzzle class. Uh, all this uncertainty uh, can be very stressful. I, I think in, in general, we need to recognize that science is very stressful. And the thing is though, if we educate ourselves more about night science, then I think it, it reduces stress because we now teach that actually this uncertainty is part of the problem. Like you, it's, it's, it's not that you're doing something wrong if you're under this uncertainty, it's actually the definition of doing science. It's if, if you're, in other words, if you're feeling stupid, it's, it's, uh, it means you're, you're doing the right thing. You're in it, you're in the problem. So uh, as promised, I'm gonna show this slide again to conclude and then hopefully have some discussion. Uh, I've told you that a really useful way to think about creativity and science is to divide science into two parts. The day science, which is the executive mode and night science, which is the conceptual, the thinking mode. In other pieces, we've talked about the um, how, how, what are the rules for improvisational uh, discussions, and you can look up that. I've I've showed you how uh, if you do if you're in hypothesis testing mode when you're analyzing a data set, you could miss something. You could miss the gorilla, right? So when you're looking at a data set, also thinking think about what hypotheses you could generate. Uh, I didn't talk to you about this, but there's there's a night science piece about how it's useful to think in an interdisciplinary way. And of course, we talked about class three puzzles, which uh, are to make external connections. So the more interdisciplinary you are, the more external connections you can make. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but but we have a whole piece about ways to be metaphorical in your in your language and how that stimulates new ideas. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what Einstein did. Einstein didn't provide the answer. He gener his genius was to generate the questions. Marie, we talked about Marie Curie too, the way she refocused the question. And we talked about how in night science, uh, puzzle switching is a great way to generate new ideas. So those are the things I have slides for. I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you, Tai. Yeah, will thanks a lot. The rest of the panelists to turn on their videos if they want, and the attendees, all of you have speaking yeah. privileges. Please go. So ahead. Whoever feels comfortable, it would be great to see more faces around. And maybe I'll start with a question until sure. other people join. Um, so in your, uh, you know, in your podcast, right, you interview lots of different scientists oh, yeah. uh, who are very, you know, impressive and creative in their own ways. And you're talking to them about if they have any, not really tricks, but if they have any ways of going into this more creative mode, right? And some, you know, talk about the, how they they walk outside and some talk about how they talk to other people and some talk about, and I found it fascinating how they imagine that they talk to other people and yeah, things like that. You. And I wanted to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I wanted to, to, you know, bring back the question to you and ask how um, the same, the same question, how, how do you get into this more? Uh, creative yeah, do, mode for your science. Yeah, how do I do it? Um, you know, I have to tell you a story. There is this old fable called stone soup. Have you heard about stone soup? You heard? You know this? I I love this yeah. story. I I would read it to my kids. Stone soup works like this. Uh, there's a 
I heard it with a fox, but there's many different versions of it. It's like a probably the oldest story ever. Uh, there's a fox and the f it's it's getting close to sunset and the fox is hungry. He's wondering what he should do for dinner. So he, um, he's got an idea. He picks up a, a big stone and he goes into the village where the other animals are living. And he knocks on the door and he says, uh, excuse me. Uh, and, and the person on the other side says, oh, no, no, we, you know, we don't want any. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to be bothered. But the fox says, no, 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 I don't want to bother you. I just want to use your stove because I want to make stone soup. And the person says, what do you, what do you mean you want to make stone soup? He's like, well, I have this, this delicious recipe. Uh, I just need to, uh, I just need a big pot and I'm going to put my stone in it. I'm going to make great stone soup. You'll love it. So the person says, okay, fine. You know, the, the what is it? The chicken says, come in. So the chicken gives them the pot and he puts the stone soup and he starts uh, adding water to it. And he's, he's stirring the water with the stone and some smoke comes out the chimney. And so some neighbors start to, to knock on the door and say, hey, what, what are you cooking? And the fox says, I'm, I'm cooking stone soup. <laughs> and uh, the neighbor says, well, uh, does carrot, do carrots go well with stone soup? Yes, carrots are great with stone soup. So bring in some carrots. Great. And then, you know, then there's some good smells. So and then some other people say, oh, what about, what about tomatoes? Yes, tomatoes are great with stone soup. And they keep knocking. And, and now the soup is really great by now. And then, uh, and then they all enjoy a great meal, and everybody's everybody thanks the fox for uh, stone soup, <laughs> delicious stone soup, and and I think that's kind of my method. I I think of, of this as like uh, like I I always I have an idea, and it's it's just this like really raw idea. It's it's not actually very useful at the beginning. It's just, it's just a stone, right? And but I keep telling it to people, and then each person says, "Oh, you know that reminds me of something." Can, can this be added? And I say, sure, it goes great with my idea. And I'll just keep adding more ideas. And by the end, we have a great project. And they, they say, oh, Itai, great job with your stone. <laughs> they don't realize that they did it, not me. <laughs> I, I, so I think, I think uh, what I learned from that is that, that it's really good to be open. I, I don't like to, to uh, wait until publication. I, um, I always, in my seminars, uh, Kind of like at the end, like you remember when I visited you at Hebrew University, and I and I I, uh, I talked about this uh, extended phenotype of cancer idea. It's a really raw idea right now, but I talked about it, even though it was raw, and people made lots of great suggestions. So I really believe in this kind of like hive mind, everybody contributing to other people's projects. Sometimes we tend to be secretive, but I've really benefited a lot from being open. And you do this kind of discussion both with, you know, different colleagues and also with your, your audience. You have these types yeah. of sessions. In the lab. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, I, I love to, to talk to, to other colleagues about their projects and contribute to them. I think that's the, it, it goes both ways on a good day. And conferences are great for this. Um, if, if they're done right, I think... I think uh, conferences sometimes are, are too big for these kinds of discussions, and that's kind of a shame. Uh, I think what you guys are doing here is really admirable because even though we're we um, may not all be able to travel, it's it all helps, right? And and uh, and and we've done some night science. Uh, Zoe, Zoe was there for one of the. We've done some workshops online where we uh, uh, try to talk about these ideas. That's amazing. Uh, so first, I want to share my screen. Uh, I, I did. I did save it. I did solve it correctly. I wow, think. that's amazing. Uh, but you know that. <laughs> that's. that's uh, I had similar parents, perhaps. Who knows if I encountered <laughs> this problem before? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I wanted. To, I wanted to say. Um, you mentioned that you and Martin are, you know, doing your research, putting this stuff together with the intention of a curriculum. Yeah. And you say you you imagine professors using it, uh, you know, in grad school programs. And I wanted to say, actually, uh, two years ago, when some of the, um, the papers were still young, uh, no, a non-professor, myself, used it with some grad students over the summer. 
Um, and so just to say, how early can, do you think one can start introducing these ideas? I, I thought it was very useful for the high school students doing research over the summer. Oh, wait. You, you mean you introduced the, the night science paper? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, we had great, great discussions. That, that was really nice. So, you know, how early, maybe in utero, maybe that's too late, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, but but also a little more seriously. And I, I see Eli I'm is sorry. preparing uh, for final remarks. Um, so it doesn't need to take much, much well, time. Well, no, I just, I just want to show you that yeah. there's a website called nightscience.org and you can just go here. And so if you ask how early, I would say now, it's just go go here to this and... No, oh, how early in life? Uh, for oh, how early in life? And oh, how that... early do you and how early do you expect to see the the results? Ah. Also, <laughs> ah, I think ideal is grad school, first year of maybe masters or PhD. I think undergrad is about solving puzzles, and grad school is about creating new puzzles. So, I, yeah, that's my answer. That it's, I, I, I'm not sure it's ideal for undergrads, but I may be mistaken, and certainly there's precocious undergrads uh, who knows uh, people calcify also over time you know maybe <laughs> it's maybe true it's late. the middle yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah anyways this was fantastic thank you so much thank you thanks itai all right thank you thank you okay great i'll just give um uh thank you itai and i'll give some last uh sort of closing remarks for um Hello, Morel, before we all head to the um, poster session. So first, I, I wanted to say a little bit um, uh, about El Morel, which is that we really aim to, to serve the community of researchers working at the forefront of machine learning and biology. Um, and you probably have all experienced this can sometimes feel like uh, isolating work uh, in most of the rooms you walk into or journals or venues you submit to or conferences you attend, you are, you're told pretty strictly to assume minimal knowledge of machine learning or minimal knowledge of biology. And so our goal with Ellen Morrell is to be a space for those who care deeply about um, both uh, machine learning and biology and, and a place where you can, um, you know, talk about um, reparameterization gradients and, and cytokine signaling in, in the same breath. Um, so we're really thrilled to have had so many great researchers, to have so many great researchers here today. And, and I hope uh, you all will take the opportunity to talk to one another um, in the gathered town following. Um, I want to say a little bit about uh, our papers and review process uh, this year. So we're we're deeply grateful first to everyone who submitted work to El Morel. Um, this year we had nearly 70 papers and posters um, covering uh, a vast range of biology, machine learning, and statistics. Um, and so thank thank you all for for submitting to the workshop. Um, it can be really difficult to get feedback on early stage work. And so this year we aimed uh, for the first time ever to provide actual um, reviews rather than just uh, uh, decisions. Um, this involved a, a big and, and sometimes cumbersome ramp up of our um, review process, but we had um, nearly 80 reviewers in total, each of which were assigned uh, two to three papers. We also had eight area chairs overseeing the reviews in different subject areas and, and filling in reviews of their own um, when reviewers occasionally plate. Um, the area chairs along with the program chairs also selected uh, these uh, contributed enlightening talks based on the reviews, um, which you've heard today, uh, with the aim also of highlighting a diverse range of, of topics and, and groups and techniques. So uh, I just wanna say on, on behalf of all the organizers and, and, and that we're profoundly grateful um, to all the reviewers in the area chairs for all their time and their dedication. Um, LMRL is a project of many, many people, um, but uh, as is often the case in conferences like these, some people end up shouldering uh, a particularly large um, burden. And so this year I wanna especially thank um, Alex Gueva for taking the lead uh, in organization, um, as well as uh, Rebecca Boyarski, Ray Jones, Ruben Lopez, Stephen Ra, Elizabeth Wood and Mornitsun. Um, I also want to thank Lois Doolittle for her invaluable administrative and technical support, both leading up to the conference and keeping things running smoothly all today. Um, I also want to say if you're if you're interested in getting involved and in helping out organizing on in the future, please please do uh, reach out. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank you all for coming to uh, LMRL 2022. Uh, 
we had some issues with the gather town capacity earlier. Too many people wanted to join, but that should now be resolved. The capacity is increased, so you should be able to log in. Um, and please enjoy uh, the posters in the gather town. They'll, they'll be open all night. Um, so uh, thank you all again and see you there.